speaker this evening, which gives me great pleasure because Christine was my supervisor for my doctorate. Um, she was the most generous and good supervisor one could ask for. Christine's involvement in the arts world in Queensland has been long standing across a variety of aspects of the arts. I don't know how many of you, or if any of you know this, but she was in fact a ballet dancer who danced with Queensland Ballet. <laughs> <laughs> and she does that when she paints, by the way. <laughs> um, she was the director of an extremely successful art educational institution, um, the uh, Arts Academy, which um, came out of Balmoral High School. She's a painter of, and she has what I like to call her double doctorate, which John and I like to call her double doctorate. Because unlike me, she wrote 100,000 words, plus she produced a one-woman show in a commercial gallery. Um, John's students only have to produce 80,000 words and do nothing else. So you see where you are here. Okay? Um, Chris's doctorate paper was called, I have to get this slide, The Landscape of the New Frontier. The Landscape of the Possible. No, no, no your doctorate yeah. the landscape was The Landscape of the New Frontier. And I believe that this paper is drawn from your doctorate and it's called The Landscape of the Possible. So, welcome Chris here and um, I am very much looking forward to hearing what she has to say. Chris is going to give her talk and any questions can be um, asked after she has finished talking. Uh, has everyone switched off their mobile phones, by the way? Yeah. Have I switched off my mobile phone? Have I? Well, yeah. <laughs> you are here. Flat. Uh, maybe Ryan can just go ding when I've been talking for about 20 minutes and I'll give, have an idea of where I am. Uh, I haven't timed myself on this, so I may have more <coughs> material than required. But anyway, I'll try and make it uh, as interesting as I can. I've got to change glasses. <coughs> I've got more glasses than the centipede has these. <laughs> I call the following discourse the landscape possible. It's going to be presented as a series of topics and those topics have been selected from a fairly wide ranging PhD thesis which was called the landscape as new frontier which was conferred in 2003. I think I should say something about the personal reasons for the PhD investigation. It was all part of an idea, I suppose, that could be broadly described as the importance of the artist as advocate. I had long advocated the importance of the disciplines of drawing and painting, both as an artist and as an educator. I became increasingly convinced that any campaign for the advancement of my chosen field, which is painting, would have to take place on several fronts. My own education and the education of others was to go hand in hand. Practice and theory in dance, personal studio practice, they're, they're the most important things, the actual practice. The establishment of the Arts Academy, which I saw as a model for educational change, that's again practice. And if it's theory, it's theory embedded in practice, as all good teaching is. That teaching extended from general adult education, secondary education, and tertiary education. I launched into the academic inquiry because I wanted to answer a lot of questions. They were questions that affected me personally as an artist, and they affected me as an educator. So, as I go through this, I've 
look at the landscape if possible and you'll see that I'll sometimes draw out the subheading. What I've done is I've extracted certain ideas and hopefully it won't be too fragmented, alright? Hopefully you'll get the gist of an argument that, I mean the reason why I've taken uh, sections, I suppose, of my inquiry is because I want to give you a sense of the importance of the inter interrelationship between disciplines, which was fundamental um, to the inquiry. As I see it, the fundamental problem facing our profession, and that is painting as fine art, is the lack of confidence in the potential of painting language and methodology to enter into important spheres of contemporary experience and thought. While as serious artists we are, importantly, engrossed in the business of exploring in depth our subject, we are also, I think, all troubled by its marginalisation. Why are we so marginalised? Roger Fry suggested that painting was rarely mainstream in history's narrative. In the correspondence between art and life, the honouring of artistic exemplars for the prevailing fall of a time are rare occurrences. Notable periods when this has occurred seem to suggest, so far as I can see, a strong relationship between science and art, remembering that the disciplines were once all one quest for knowledge and were not separated into the professions. In the Renaissance, the work of Brunelleschi and Da Vinci was supported by, it seemed, a climate of thought. It has often appeared that painting has lost its significance. At the extreme, it has become a blank canvas or a confused material object hanging on to survival through the shock of the new or appropriation of the antique. In all these guises, it has no hope. Over the years, I was to pursue a course of inquiry often outside of my specialist comfort zone. Whenever I walk into another specialist sphere, I'm a layman. Why did I do it? To find support for my discipline beyond the vacuous theorising and navel-gazing which still pervades art institutions. The question I asked was how did we get to this? I found that lack of faith in painting as fine art and in particular with reference to this study Lack of, paint, lack of faith in painting as an aesthetic response to nature had deep and common roots. The study identifies a problem, the modern dichotomy between art and nature. For me, this is the fundamental problem. <coughs> the, the split between art and nature remains at odds with an emerging scientific and just for want of a better word I'll call it ecological worldview. And also it's at odds with the growing desire to establish contemporary scientific and environmental aesthetics. And here's one of these bullet subheadings, the landscape of the possible. The artist may accept at face value traditions of pictorial representation in landscape painting without further questioning. Believing that it is enough to work within the sanctioned methodology of his or her profession. Such unquestioning acceptance will ensure that a tradition eventually founders through lack of challenge and the will to forge a contemporary relevance. Now don't confuse contemporary relevance with the usual jargon that some um, spilt in institutions. The landscape as art at its highest level of achievement has contri contributed to our understanding of nature by stretching the limits of traditional boundaries. That does not mean that tradition need, doesn't need to be understood. It has to be understood. That's fundamental. That's the language. 
Now, the possible dimensions of, of human comprehension, and it's always human comprehension, of the natural world is a landscape which extends beyond the sphere of any single specialism and therefore beyond the boundaries of the creative association of the landscape as art. All right, introduction to the dichotomy between art and nature. In contemplating Darwin's scientific evolutionary theory of nature, the eminent biological scientist Richard Dawkins, 2008, suggests that he finds consolation in the elegant, elegant ideas and the beauty of science. As attached both to a down-to-earth wonder of nature and, importantly for science, the evidence proof of natural law. Artists may share the wonder and ideas of beauty, but not the confidence that their discipline may make any meaningful contribution to the great adventure of defining new meaning in nature. And yet, our methodologies often parallel those of the biological scientist. We set up our gear in the landscape, observe, collect the data in a crafted language, while immersing ourselves in the down-to-earth qualities of nature. Then we go back into our studios, theorise, reconstruct, compose, harmonise, return to the environment to gather more evidence, abstract it further, compare it to exemplary developments in our own discipline, great paintings, and to our other findings graphic as well as painterly. So why, if that's true, aren't we confident? And I don't believe we are. The abstract conceptual formulas of art making and as far as I'm concerned all languages are abstract and the formulas of art that we involve ourselves in are always tested and adjusted in the light of empirical observation. Okay, here comes another subheading. Aesthetic theorising and the death of picturing. It appears that in the 21st century the idea of an aesthetic response to nature has validity in almost everything other than, and I'll call it high art at the risk of being shot down as an elitist. The very disciplines that should offer the greatest hope of aesthetic reconciliation with the indifferent forces of a modern conception of nature have peripheral significance. By the mid 20th century, philosophical study of the aesthetics of nature reaches its lowest point with the almost exclusive focus of analytical aesthetics on philosophy of art. Here comes the name gazing. The aesthetic appreciation of nature is considered to be parasitic upon the aesthetic appreciation of art. The late 20th century revival of the aesthetic investigation of nature understandably jettisoned art-based models of appreciation. If art can't come up with the goods, let's get rid of it. Environmental aesthetics has been set free from the irrelevance of modern art and its scope continues to broaden to include not only natural environments but human-made environments and the aesthetics of everyday life. Okay, here comes another subheading. Modern scepticism, philosophical, aesthetic, artistic. Complete lack of faith in fine arts or the higher arts and in the case focus of this research, landscape paintings and, I, and really it's not just the landscape, it's all paintings that involves natural form and of course that includes the human form. Okay, paintings language potential and I'll say landscape paintings, landscape potential and the landscape is a metaphor for a pictorial response to the natural world. If you can just think of it as a metaphor 
rather than thinking that it is precisely landscape painting. So, landscape painting's language potential in picturing forth a possible world. And this is the landscape of the possible. Modern scepticism, picturing and metaphysical speculation. Another subheading. Art theorists and artists bear much of the responsibility for art's neglect in this important arena of thought, but they are by no means solely accountable. The death of picturing and metaphysical speculation in modern painting was part of a broader philosophical trend which emphasised the epistemological basis of knowledge. In the early years of the 20th century, artists embraced the necessary adventure, and it is a necessary adventure, of exploring the nature and limits of pictorial language. So I'm not suggesting that understanding knowledge and how it's constructed is not as important, not important. It, it is. But by the 1950s, this quest had begun the descent into what I call real limitation. Greenberg. And Ryan said, what would you say if Greenberg came into the room? I don't know, but this is an extract from Greenberg. Greenberg, Bonner's painting, 1961, advocated the purification of painting by completely eliminating picturing or illusion and focusing upon the limitations of painting, its materials and flatness, a self-referencing aesthetic cleansed of historical association and tradition. The attack upon high art in the anti-art mainstream from the 1960s, the 1970s rhetoric of painting is dead, to the present would appear to be partly the result of an unrelenting reductionism coupled to the pursuit of the new, no matter what the cost. Whitehead, the philosopher and mathematician, Science in the Modern World, 1929. Whitehead seems to have made a valid point when he suggested that important as epistemology is in, the philosophy, in philosophy, the difficulties attached to the questioning of the foundations of knowledge are often really camouflaged metaphysical difficulties. This was food for much thought. When metaphysical questions, and I'll talk about what they might be later, seem to be no longer, they're questions of I think everybody who thinks deeply is always thinking about, you know, what is self, for example. All the great philosophers had a go at what is self. These are metaphysical questions. And, and if, art, if art turns in on itself, it just says, what is art? Whereas there are other things that are important, not just what is art, what is self? You know, what, <laughs> what is causation if you're a phys phys physicist? Okay, perhaps if you're an artist as well. Okay, when metaphysical questions seem to be no longer relevant to art and the expression of deeper meaning was regarded as mere romantic fiction, such as the illusion of self or an external world, art turned in upon itself and became preoccupied with its own limitations. A long list of ideas were cast aside as pictorial and conceptual fictions. For example, ideas of transcendence. What do I mean by transcendence? Transcending the picture plane in terms of the external world that anyone that's interested in natural form is always transcending the picture plane in order to, to invest their thought um, and their feelings about these things. Ideas of transcendence, aesthetic value, metaphysical meaning, mastery of language, hope, engagement with the natural world. And I think engagement with the natural world is particularly important because it disappears um, after a certain point in the 20th century. It becomes romantic fiction. And I'm not knocking Romanticism because I'm going to talk about the Romantic period which I think is particularly important. The perceived arena for the artist's performance was increasingly an urbanised technological landscape dominated by electronic media. The more restricted the modernist or late modernist assumptions about the limits of art became, the more art tended towards an expression of either scepticism or dread. 
before I come to another subheading. Exploring possibilities within a limitation. Oh, this is not a subheading, this is, this is an emphasis. Exploring possibilities within a limitation. And all language is limitation. All methodology, methodologies of any specialist area are limitations. But exploring within a limitation is different from limiting possibilities. It's a totally different thing. And it seems to be confused. The landscape of the possible, again, picturing and metaphysical speculation, continuing. The pathetic and art fallacy. As painting probed its own limitations, practitioners substituted the material fallacy for the pathetic fallacy. And graphic, painterly language was separated from its potential to picture. Clark, Ken Clark, 1976 suggested that the old images of nature which had once sustained us had to be discarded in the light of newfound knowledge. And he was talking about everything that comes, I guess, with the, an idea of evolutionary theory. He said that the best hope for a continuation of landscape painting consisted in an extension of the pathetic fallacy and the use of, uh, that was the term, I believe, coined, it was, I, coined by Ruskin, I believe, pathetic fallacy. An extension of pathetic fallacy and the use of the landscape as a focus for our own emotions. Now this is really at the crux of the matter. This idea that, you know, if you listen to a biologist who is a mechanist, I'll, I'll, I'll say, and they look at a random stretch of rainforest. I think of something Dawkins said. He said, that view is not harmonious. You go in there and you look at what's happening in nature and it's brutal and it's the survival of the fittest. However, it is the artist that looks and selects and creates a harmonious set of relationships. And I think that's critical. And the, and the pathetic fallacy and that idea that we can express our consciousness through what I see as a permeable, permeable uh, boundary in picture making that we, our consciousness can extend into this external world. That is a pathetic fallacy. The great abstract paintings of Turner, here we go. Just need to. Just got to find it. Had pointed beyond the sensual manipulations of paint <coughs> to the natural world. Increasingly, modern abstract painting was sort of only at itself. The pathetic fallacy and illusory fusion of human emotions with an external world beyond self is replaced <coughs> by self as a reality of language. The inner self as a linguistic pattern within the material, the art fallacy. <coughs> Thus, instead of the metaphorical picturing of the landscape as palpitating with human emotions, in, or I would prefer to say in the modern understanding, mind, let's not split the levels of consciousness, let's just say that that's mind and all levels of consciousness are involved in great painting. Okay. What began to happen was that the pure abstract forms and the paint material itself <coughs> would attempt to express, I guess, um, spiritual essence. So, I'll get rid of <coughs> that great painting. Now, 
Kandinsky's pure abstractions, which I don't have here, nonetheless, like Rothko, still retain something of the traditional painter's illusion of nature's atmospheric space as did many of Rothko's abstractions. For example, Rothko's Green on Blue, 1956, depicts, this is all my interpretation. I've got to say, whenever I'm talking about paintings, I'm trying to really just talk about an intellectual inquiry. I think it's really important paintings speak for themselves. And I actually think it's dangerous for any painter to talk about their own paintings. Um, I often think you don't really know yourself. Um, what the implications of a painting might be. You can look back on paintings you painted 20 years ago and understand more fully <coughs> what you were about. So I'm not really, this is conjecture here, but I may be safe or unsafe if I say that he depicts a luminous, soft edged rectangle of shimmering void torn out of its contextual landscape on which its meaning depends. Rothko's atmospheric space is a floating mirage, a vestige of this world, an illusion dependent upon its illusionistic predecessors. So what I'm saying is that atmospheric treatment of paint there, we wouldn't be able to read it unless, and this is true of all painting, we understand we were able to look at perhaps Turner, the Impressionist, or, or indeed any other painter that used paint in such a way that they create, could create by paint alone this sense of, of depth and atmosphere. 20. Huh? Oh. 20. Okay, 20. Ooh. Thank you. However, I'm not saying that this is this. I have sympathy with the, with the notion of looking for a pure abstraction of some sort. After all, it's a platonic realm in many ways. It is when the external is entirely extinguished that we reach real limitation and painting ceases its traditional role. For example, Rauschenberg's, Rauschenberg's white on white paintings, 1953. And then everything is gone. You know, it's, it's no longer anything at all. Okay. Art and nature, aesthetic unity. The unique potential of art language, the aesthetic dimension. In the late 20th century, many theorists and artists have denied that either aesthetic experience or the fine arts should be distinguished as separate branches of knowledge having a special kind of value. This modernist denial often amounted to full-scale rejection. The aesthetic dimension of human experience and the fine arts are ultimately inseparable. This is my opinion. And an attack upon the one proves to be an attack upon the other. Fuller saw the aesthetic dimension, a phrase which he borrowed from Marcuse, 1964, as a human potentiality, which ultimately depended upon a unity forged between the parts of human nature the sensual, moral, spiritual and intellectual aspects of experience in indivisibly linked into a meaningful whole. Ruskin, modern painters. And Ruskin, um, I think, he's influenced so many. Ruskin had laboured to produce a unified aesthetic theory. While he ultimately failed to do this, his varied 